sounds kind of crazy. Um, hi. Okay, so did, did I send that bio? Did I send that, is that the bio I sent to you? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I noticed mine. I didn't recognise mine either. Yeah, no, but you're not going to get a cyber security lecture, I promise you. Um, I did 13 years of that, I'm not doing any more. Um, so, so, very quickly, who am I? I can beg you quicker because of the, the very polite introduction, but um, I'm, I'm the director of Samurai Digital Security, that's what I am now. Um, and as a company, we provide cybersecurity services, everything from system penetration testing through to uh, information governance and compliance on the softer side of things and training as well. So, uh, yeah, I have a PhD, that's true. Um, and th I guess the thing I'm quite proud about is that it's, I, I, nobody's corrected me on this yet, and I'm, I believe it to be the case, but I think I was the first person to get a, what we call a hard technical PhD in cybersecurity. So it was quite a new subject when I first started researching it. Um, there's quite a few people out now as profs of cybersecurity and other doctorates, but in 2010, I think I was the first one to actually get a hard technical PhD, so I'm quite, quite proud of that. Um, I'm an ex-academic, obviously, that's where the, the research <coughs> came from. had six years at uh, the University of Derby, then I did another six years at Sheffield Hallam University, then I did a year at um, De Montfort University, and for four years of that um, I was building a company in the background. And, and academia, you can kind of get away with that a bit, you get some time over Christmas and summer and Easter, which of course you're meant to be spending researching time, that's what you're supposed to be using, uh, building a company. And they got too big and in the end I went down to part time and eventually I left and the universities were getting quite annoyed with me anyway because I wasn't giving them any money. Um, so so that's, that's a bit about me. I also work with the National Crime Agency as well. I work as a National Crime Agency Special with the National Cyber Crime Unit and I help those guys um, crack cases, just bring a bit of expertise into the organisation to try help them find out what the bad guys are up to. And uh, that's, that had a, I, I got my, my 15 minutes of fame, if you like, came because I helped convict um, the members of a high profile hacking fraternity called Lulsec, which you, you might not have heard of. But when I deliver this, when I tell people geeky crowds, right, they're all quite interested. But, <laughs> but Lulsec were, uh, were uh, they had the US Senate and the FBI and Sony and the Sun newspaper. And they, uh, they reported that two packs of life and well and living in New Zealand, and the story broke all over the world. Unfortunately, it wasn't. Um, and I, I helped collect evidence against those guys and helped lead to their conviction. And off the back of that, there was a bit of media activity, and I, I got to meet one of the guys that I collected evidence about on Newsnight, and they built it Hacker Meets Tracker, and it was. Anyway, do you know why? It's just a load of fun, really. <laughs> Uh, here's the irony though, one of those guys, who, who is uh, Ryan Ackroyd, who was Kayla in Lulsec, that was his, his uh, monkey or his nickname in, in Lulsec. I got to know him because they did a play on Lulsec, which they invited me to out of irony, I think. But I got to know the guy really well, and he's actually worked with us a few times since then. Very, very intelligent guy, he was the brains behind it, he was a hacker, the true technical hacker. And he's a fabulous guy, actually a load of fun. Uh, unfortunately, he's had two years in prison, so we can't use him that often because <laughs> organisations don't always like that. Um, so, what, what's this talk about? So, I've not done this before, by the way, this one slide thing. I've normally got the slides going on, but I saw them do it on TED, and I thought, okay, <coughs> that's how it's done nowadays, is it? So, I don't know, it might get terribly wrong, that's why I've got the props with me here. Um, so, what's this talk about? It's, my pet subject is psychology. So cybersecurity is what I do, but I do have this interest in what makes people tick, why people make the decisions they make. So this talks about why, why we ignore all the scary figures, right? So normally when you get a, a, somebody who speaks on this subject on cybersecurity, you have slide after slide after slide of terrifying figures, right? You know, this amount of people have been breached, uh, you know. So if, for example, if I say to you that, uh, Ransomware has been increasing 350% year on year for the last three years. It's a truth, right? I'm not making that up as a statistic. I could also tell you that 90% of all the breaches that occur within an organisation happen as a result of phishing. And they're, they're facts, right? But I don't think they're going to scare you at all. Not really. Not as individuals. You'll sat, be sat there thinking, oh, really? That's interesting. I don't really think that applies to me. 
And I want to talk about why that is. I want to talk about why the scary statistic talks don't work. Why, why the message isn't getting through about the issues, even with, so I, I did a thing on BBC yesterday, on the news yesterday, fresh from the <coughs> BBC news, uh, it's like on, on uh, British Airways and the massive fine that they've just received, 183 million pounds, well not, they haven't received it as a notice to fine, but I think, I'm hopeful it's going to go through, 183 million pounds for a breach of a website where companies' uh, banking details, the credit card details and the CSPs were leaked. And, uh, you know, the, so it's terrible, right? But it's, it's, nobody's going to really pay much attention. I really don't think they will. And I want to talk about why that is, why we don't, why that, why we're not processing this information in the right way. Uh, I'm also going to tell you about why you're probably sceptical about some of the things I'm going to tell you as well. I'll say these things, and maybe maybe they're not going to sink in. I mean, I'm, obviously I'm going to try and get them to sink in, but the truth of it is, scary stuff doesn't always work. So I'm going to talk about why that is, and. I'm going to borrow a lot of what I'm going to say from uh, Daniel Kahneman. And some of you may know Daniel Kahneman before if you were in finance or economic circles. He's a really big wheel, right? Um, he also won the Nobel Peace Prize, Peace Prize, or Nobel Prize, not the Peace one, Nobel Prize, for the um, <coughs> analyzing decision making and what makes us tick. So this has been around in psychology for a while, these two types of decision making processes. One's called System 1 and one's called System 2. And Daniel Kahneman really brought them to the forefront though, he added some real animation to it. So what system one is, is, system one is this fast way of processing information, making decisions really quickly. It's your gut, it's your intuition. It's the, it's the kind of decision making process that you'd use if you saw a face and the face was angry, and you'd know it was an angry person straight away. You wouldn't need to make a decision, you'd just see it immediately. It's, it's the type of decision making process that that our ancestors would have used, you know, walking the plains of Africa and a lion jumps out in front of them. And they think, okay, I'm gonna put as much distance between myself and that lion as possible. And they make that decision immediately, without thought. It's instinctive. You know, they don't stop and think to themselves, well, you know, I think that's a lion, but I'm not really sure. Maybe, maybe it's a friendly lion, or perhaps it's not a lion at all. Maybe it's just a, a sack that's blowing across the field or the plain. And while he's thinking this, he gets eaten. I <laughs> say, so that isn't gonna work. <coughs> So we have system one for a reason, it's, it's probably why we survive as long as we have. System two, on, on the other hand, is um, reasoned, logical, slow, thought through. It's where we analyse the information before we make a decision. We really take some effort to make sure that we're making a decision based on facts and not on guilt. So it's the kind of decision making process you'd use if I asked you what 19 squared was. You'd have to sit, you'd have to think. You'd have to calculate, and then you come, unless you know, you, you're some kind of rain man, and you can just do that. Dustin Hoffman, rain man, come, and come up with a figure immediately. You know, it's, it's system two is the process that you're using. It's 361. I don't want anybody sat there working in that one at all. And they're saving that. So I know that one. I'll just work that out because it's more interesting than what this guy said. Uh, it probably is. Uh, so right, so they're the, they're the two kind of they're the two kind of decision making process for the system one and system two. Now the problem is that, that when we're making complex decisions, we always think we're using system two. We always think we are. But you know, research has proven this. Uh, Daniel Kahneman's research has proven this, and all the since have repeated the research. Times when we think we're doing, making decisions reasoned things with system two, we're actually using system uh, one, and we don't know we are. System one wins every system two every single time. Your gut will always win in your decision making process. It's quite, I mean sometimes it's right, but there's a lot of problems with system one. There's issues with it. And these issues, these problems, these errors that occur when we use system one are referred to as cognitive biases. And there's loads of them, right? If you research into the stacks of cognitive biases, but I'm just going to talk about four cognitive biases. I'm going to talk about how they relate to cyber security, because that's why I'm here. So I'm going to start off by talking about the ostrich effect. <laughs> and the ostrich effect, you've probably already worked it out right, what the ostrich effect is. If you, if you imagine an ostrich burying his head in the sand, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about when we ignore information that we don't like. We ignore news that we don't want to hear. These are proven cognitive biases. These are not just things I'm making up. Everybody does this. Right? All of us do it. We don't like the information, we tend to ignore it. 
And that's called the ostrich effect. By the way, ostriches don't bury their head in the sand. It's total nonsense. It's not a myth. But nevertheless, you get the idea. So it's one of the reasons why we ignore those scary statistics. So when I mentioned <coughs> earlier about the, you know, the scary facts that you see, you'll ignore them because you don't want to hear them, right? You, and you certainly don't want to make an effort to fix it because, heck, you've got better things to do, right? You've got companies to run, you've got money to make, and, and, and cyber security, you don't, maybe, you don't, maybe you don't understand it that well or you don't want to understand it, so you just ignore it. Very, very common. It's part of the problem. So when I go to see clients, for example, I see this quite regularly. So I meet clients or prospects, and we have a conversation. We talk about problems with their business, and you know we look at the the, the, the information that they're storing, the systems that store the information, the people, the processes, the policies that they have, and we look at the whole thing. Because the problem with cybersecurity courses is such a broad spectrum. Where, where do you start, right? Where should you put your time and your money and your research your resources? Should it be compliance? Should it be system penetration testing? Should it be staff awareness training? Should it be I don't know. So many things to go at. Where do I start, right? So that's what I try and help companies with to, 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 to you know, give them a plan for where they need to go. And I say to them when I meet them, I say, I'm going to say this, right? And I tell this is me talking to them now. I say, I'm going to say this to you, right? That, that you're probably not going to get back in touch with me for a while after we've had this conversation because I know it through experience. So I do, I do the best job I can. Maybe it's just because I'm useless at sales. That could be it. I'm not really a salesman, so that's probably part of the problem. But I think mostly um, it's because you know that they, they, they don't want to process that negative information. They do get back to me eventually. They get back to me when they've been breached. And everybody gets breached eventually. And then when they do, they get back to me there. Because I say, do you know what? You know, you were right. We have had a problem in this area, and we didn't need to sort it out, and we didn't sort it out. And I even remember that conversation where you told me I'd get back in touch with you when it happened, and that's why I'm getting back in touch with you. Um, at which point, I'm happy with that. That's great. Um, but you know, obviously, I don't say I told you so because I have learned actually that that's really quite bad for business. So I don't say that. Um, and, and then, then we work through the problems. But it's it's an example of the uh, the ostrich effect. So another one. That's one. So here's another one. How many for time? Oh, okay. Five minutes. Got five minutes left. Yeah, for the break. Yeah. Wow, let's speed up. We've been a bit late. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do it in five, I'll try. Overconfidence is another problem. That's right? so another issue that we have. Right? We're under estimating times. I am, in that way. Yeah, <laughs> we've we, we got are. a few minutes, Grace, so David, oh, okay. because we've got a coffee break next. So. Okay, well, I better stop wasting more time talking. <laughs> <laughs> so, overconfidence is another problem. It's another issue that we have with cognitive biases, and I'll give you a quick example here. So, we, an organisation that we've done a lot of work with recently turned around and, uh, and said to me, and, and my colleagues, uh, you can't breach our organisation, it's impenetrable. You know, we really know what we're doing, we've locked it down. And obviously, you can imagine, as a, we're a group of geeks, you say that to us, and we're like, yeah, okay. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, I bet you, and I won't tell <coughs> the name of the company, but I will tell you where they're based, right? Or where they tend to be based. You know what I mean when I tell you where it's from. I bet you 10 Isle of Man pounds, right? <laughs> I bet you 10 Isle of Man pounds, you can't breach our systems. And I said, well, actually, it's a very cheap way to get a system penetration test. I said, oh, okay, well, I'll tell you what else. You have an open checkbook in terms of our cybersecurity budget. So we all tried to breach their systems. We didn't get anywhere. Technically, he was right. But then we switched to social engineering. And we looked through LinkedIn, we looked through Facebook, we looked through Twitter. We looked, at, uh, we looked through the company's house and found out about the directors, where they lived. We looked at what they were up to. And we social engineered them. And we had a, actually Ryan Ackroyd, who was Kayla, was part of this actually. He gave us a lot of the ideas, it was a lot of fun. And I had a little script, but the phone would ring when, um, when we actually managed to get somebody's credentials when they put their username and password into our fake pages. So we fished them. And we actually got success. The two that we got success with one was a, um, an employment satisfaction survey, and the other one, which was, which was my personal favourite, uh, was payroll restructuring from their HR manager, we sent it from their HR manager, payroll restructuring, uh, and, then we and then we sent a recall afterwards to try and pretend that we were recalling it, just to get further curiosity. Um, and, and, and the phone went off and we all leapt on it, we went on like a high mentality, because that's what the hackers do and that's what we do when we're replicating it. And all their intellectual property, I, the person whose email I looked at, all their intellectual property was in the email. We sent items and deleted items. Um, drawing schematics of, I can't say the company was, but the machinery that they use, their crown jewels, if you like, all stored in email. 
And I've, I also found an email, the username and password of their FTP site, so I sat on that and harvested more details from that too. People, I don't know, get it. Why do people think that their email's safe? You know, they'll, they'll encrypt documents everywhere else, but just leave stuff in their attachments and their email. It's insane. We had a lot of fun with that. Um, anyway, that's, that's an example of, uh, of uh, overconfidence. You know, they, they just assumed that they were unreachable, and they're not. Uh, so I've got two more, which I'm going to have to be very quick with. Gambler's fallacy. Probably not as obvious as the other ones. I'll tell you what gambler's fallacy is. So I went to the casino once in a while, right? Won quite a lot of money. Quite happy. Went back again. Second time, won again. Won a third time. Odds and evens, reds and blacks. Um, put, a, put a token down, put some tokens around it. By the time I'd won the third time, I knew that fourth time. I knew I was going to win. I didn't think it. I knew it. It was a certainty. I had a system. I learned that night why they put cash point machines in casinos. <laughs> I got totally tuned out, and that's what the gambler's fallacy is. We think that something's worked before, it's going to work again. It's going to continue to work. We think all the time with breaching, breach system breaches. We've never been breached, so we're never going to be breached. There's two things wrong with that. First thing is, just because you haven't in the past doesn't mean that you won't be in the future. And the second thing is, yes, you have been breached, and you don't know. And I, I, honestly, you don't believe me, but I'm telling you. All the system penetration tests that we do for organisations and incident response, we always find evidence that somebody's been into that organisation. A back door's been installed, an account's been opened up that wasn't there before, logins from somewhere abroad that they didn't know about. We always find them. So, you know, you have to be careful that one. Gambler's fallacy. Very, very quickly, final one, because I know I'm short time. Confirmation bias. And this one, I'm going to bring in the other three as well as an example. So, we have gambler's fallacy, overconfidence, and uh, what's the first one? Uh, ostrich effect. All of them were involved in this particular incident. When Sam and I was first starting out, about four years ago, we were a pretty new company. We did a system penetration test for the NHS, at one of the hospitals in the NHS. And off the back of that, we found a lot of things, but one of the things we found, if you were geeks, you'd know what I mean, but you'd probably work it out anyway. We found SMB version one was open to the internet on those systems. SMB version one is a system which WannaCry exploits to get control of the systems. It's what WannaCry ransomware when it disrupted the NHS, it got through via that vulnerability. We told them more than 12 months before WannaCry hit the NHS, we told them that that was an incident which they needed to be sorted out. And what they said to us, we've got some experts coming in soon that we're paying a lot of money to. Mm -hmm. You know, we're sold on what we need to do. We have this firewall that's going in. We have this antivirus that's going in. They know what they're doing. You know, once, once they've been through and we've seen them all, we'll talk to you about it afterwards. And we never heard from them again. And then WannaCry hit. I had the NCA phoning me up asking me to help out. My sister was an ex and is an exec at, at the NHS. She came round. She was in many of one side. NCA were on the phone and the other. Now I'm not saying that if it, you know if they'd have listened to us, that what I cried wouldn't have affected them. But that is actually exactly what I'm saying, <laughs> particularly for that hospital at least. Anyway, and that is confirmation bias. That is where they, they have information about what they think they need to do and they're only going to listen to information that's related to that. Anything they read, anything they're told otherwise, it isn't what they already believe they will ignore. And that's what they did. So they were responsible for confirmation bias, they have the responsible for the ostrich effect because they bury their head in the sand, they're responsible for overconfidence because they just believe that they were right, and they were also, you know, fell foul to gambler's fallacy because they just assumed, because it's never happened to them before, it's never going to happen to them again. I'm out of time. I did have a bit about how you could get past these. <laughs> I stop using System 1 and start using System 2, but I don't have time to talk about it. However, I do have a stand out there. And if you want to come and talk to me afterwards, that would be awesome. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, David. Uh,